And so what we'll talk about today is our first part of physical hydrology. Um, I guess I can scribble some things on this. Um, and th th yeah, I don't want to give you whiplash, but this is kind of an overview of what we'll uh, talk about. And we made the point last time that when we're talking about contaminant hydrology, there are kind of two different parts of it. The first part is multi-phase flow and transport. So when you drop gasoline into uh, onto soil, or if it leaks from an underground storage tank, or if it's a denser than uh, good initiative, if it's a denser than water compound, then it will travel as a free phase, gasoline on its own, until it gets somewhere. And we'd like to know how it travels that way, what are the kind of mechanisms that we have to uh, take into account, because that says something about what it, where it will go, how far it might go in the subsurface, where we might look for it, what the uh, volume of it might be in its distribution in the subsurface, whether it's all in one point, one, one location, or whether it spreads out, whether it's above the water table or below the water table. So those are questions we might like to ask ourselves. And so we need to understand a little bit about the mecha mechanisms by which it migrates as a single phase, as gasoline itself. That might take the first few weeks, few months, until it gets into that position. And then after that, if it doesn't biodegrade, gasoline tends to biodegrade quite quickly, in months to years. Uh, but some of these other denser than water organic chemicals don't. They, they're there for decades and have been in, in situ for decades, 50 years, uh, 50 years plus, Second World War era plus. And so if that's the case, then the question is, how quickly do they dissolve in water, and how are they carried downstream to somewhere that someone might drink them in their drinking water? And so there's those two very distinct components in what we'll deal with. So the first part is dealing with talking about capillary behavior. And again, I guess I should plug things in, not around my leg. Uh, so this will work. And so maybe the easiest way to, to think about this is to think about um, a swimming pool. I'll have to practice my handwriting for sure. And in an aquifer. And so the swimming pool idea is you have a swimming pool and it's filled with water and you have the misfortune to drop some gasoline in it. So what would happen to the gasoline? Well if you drop it in a swimming pool what it will do is it'll just form a, a very thin layer on the surface. It'll come in as a, a little glob as you could imagine but it would spread out until it's basically a, a monomolecular layer uh, thick and covers the whole surface as some kind of sheen. Uh, so it goes from being a little a glob to spreading out. I don't know what the density of treacle is or syrup is, but if syrup is less dense than water and you put it in water, then what you'd expect to happen would be that maybe it would float on water, but it wouldn't reconfigure itself as a long, thin layer which would be spread out. And so there's something to do with the behavior of those compounds that is different in one case, it's surface tension, uh, that causes one to act uh, differently. So this would be the case if uh, the density of this is less, so less than, sorry, than the density of the water it's going in. And if it were the opposite of that, then what it would do is it would sink. And if it was a dense, not, so this would be an l apple like gasoline. An apple stands for non-aqueous phase liquid. So in other words, it doesn't have any water in it at all, non-aqueous phase liquid. Uh, which means it doesn't really mix with water. And if it was a denser than water liquid, denapple, then what it would do is it would sink to the bottom, maybe 
as a drop, but when it got to the bottom, then it would spread out just like it had done on the surface because it couldn't go any further through this barrier, whatever this barrier is. If it was treacle, then what it would do, then maybe it would sink as a an, an inverse bubble, if you like, so something that's denser than the water around it. And then maybe on the bottom, it would reorient itself so it was like a, a lens, basically a lens. And so that's not really very different oops, to what would happen for a uh, in an aquifer. And so in an aquifer, uh, you have the ground surface it's full of sand, say. Below the ground surface, you have a water table, which is the maximum height where the water saturates to. And if you go through the same activities as before, if you took a, an Eln apple, and dropped it from the surface, then it would pass down through here. And it would try and do this again and spread out, but actually it wouldn't be all that successful at doing that. What it would possibly do is because it would add a little bit of weight to the water table, it would actually spread out not as a monomolecular layer, but as a lens, a bit like this case here. Because within this lens, what's now different is that this is now sitting inside a whole bunch of grains of soil, if it's a sand, and you can imagine that this stuff is, is stuck on uh, the boundaries and filling up, so the dark stuff is the, the non-aqueous phase liquid, it's kind of filling up the space that's a, trying to attach it to uh, the grains, the glass, the quartz, because it likes quartz, so it's happy to be on quartz. Just like water arises in the capillary, this is sticking itself to the to the glass. And so instead of being a monomolecular layer thick, it's uh, actually a lens. It's a bit more like, like this behavior that we expect here. And the reason for that is that there's something kind of pulling it back and stopping it spreading as far as it can laterally. And as a result of that, we end up with this lens that sits here on top of the water table. And if we wanted to suck that out, we'd put a straw in here and suck it out. And we'd want to know how big is this? What's its saturation? We haven't talked about yet. What's its distribution? Is it fully non-aqueous phase liquid or there's some water linked in there? Is there some air left in there? Is there a chimney above it where there's a smear of this other stuff that's left within this chimney? And that would all be interesting stuff we'd like to know to be able to say something about uh, what it looks like in the subsurface and where we recover it. If we take a Dean apple and allow it to go through, I will have to get in practice in writing again on this thing. Then, because it's denser than water, it would be happy to hit the water table. Why would it stop there? It wouldn't. It would just keep on going down. And it would do exactly the same thing when it hits some barrier. Uh, this is one of your questions in the quiz. This is what we refer to as a capillary barrier. It's one of the questions in the quiz from... Um, Tuesday, not today. And it would do the same thing. Again, it's spreading out because it's it doesn't spread out completely because it's got stuff pulling it back. Uh, this is what it previously looked like. It spread out to a very thin layer, but now, because within this porous medium, uh, it's got uh, forces pulling back on it. And so we'd like to be able to understand exactly what the processes are that control the migration of these things. And so that's a reasonable analog to, to talk about. We know that things... So when you look at um, uh, oil and vinegar salad dressing, one sits over the other one. It's exactly the same processes that, that go on here. And so that's what we're interested in finding out. Yes, go ahead. What would be an example of a capillary barrier? Capillary barrier would be something with very small pores in it. There's something like a clay, which would also have a very low permeability. But it's not permeability that stops it. Of course, we haven't really defined those terms yet. Yeah, so something like clay, something that has, has very small pores in it. Big pores like gravel, would, it would go through quite easily. So concrete would be the same thing as well if you put it in the bottom of a swimming pool. Yeah, thanks. All right? So that's kind of what we're interested in, in understanding. Um, and so, that, so the first thing to understand is what the equilibrium behavior might be, where it finds itself as rest. 
And these are perhaps better figures of what we've just been talking about. The top one for an Elm apple, something that's lighter than water. And so the idea is you spill it here, so it goes into the groundwater right here. It goes through the porous medium. This is the water table that exists at some depth below and did look originally like this. It has a gradient to it. The gradient means that since it has a change in head with length, then from what you know about Darcy's law, the flow velocity, Darcy velocity, is equal to hydraulic conductivity times the change in head with length. This is just Darcy's law. So this means that water is flowing within this saturated portion, but that's not really what we're interested in here. We're interested in only in the fact that this stuff is going to come down here, it's going to hit the water table, it's going to be held in place, and it's going to try and form a lens. The lens is going to have some height to it, so it's going to have an extra weight of that fluid, and so it's going to depress the water table slightly. And so this lens would be a lens of gasoline, which is if you like, um, cradled by the water table underneath it because it's pushing up on it. Um, it can't spread out infinitely far along this because it's got some capillary forces pulling it in. It will have left this chimney, which is uh, smeared material above. So in other words, the gasoline come here, a small portion of it will be left as uh, a smear in this chimney, which could, of course, uh, evaporate up to the surface and go out of the system. Or it could be washed down, as you have, for instance, rain coming down on this. And rain washes down through this. This will actually load the dissolved components back into the, the Vado zone and into the, the water table. Um, but our main interest here is that once this has traveled to this place, maybe in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, it's going to sit there and it's not going to go anywhere because it's happily held by these very strong capillary forces which are in equilibrium with the only other forces which are present here, and that's uh, its self-weight. Uh, so the only force that's causing it to sink through here is, its, is gravity, self-weight, no other pressures. And so over time, the water that flows past this in the groundwater, which will still be flowing, this is static, this will dissolve portions of this, and it will start to make a plume that will go down gradient, and this will be the, the zone of contamination of fluid that has gasoline dissolved in it. Uh, this is pure gasoline almost, uh, with no water in it. This is almost 100% water with trace amounts of the, the contaminant. In it. And so that's what the behavior is that we'd expect for an Elm apple, light to the water. For Dean apples, we don't have any such constraint. So anything that we put into the top here will do exactly the same as before. It'll be happy to go down vertically. It'll leave a smear as it goes down vertically. But as soon as it hits the water table, there's no reason why it should stop. So it'll just keep on going. It'll keep on going until it hits something which is our capillary barrier. Low permeability typically, but it's not permeability that keeps it out. It's the very small pore throats, which is the essence of what we're talking about. And it will make a lens that might look like this. And it will spread in the same way as we talked about before. If there's a slope to this um, interface, then it may keep on tumbling down here and, and spread out laterally. So we don't know. Um, typically, we might expect that the, the smear that is left in this part here might be thicker as you get closer to this lens and thinner as you go above it. Uh, we'll find out the reasons for that as we uh, keep on talking about this. Um, and again, in this, this is the slope of the groundwater table with a, a capillary fringe above it, which we'll talk about that. So this, everything below this line, the pressure here is equal to atmospheric pressure. Uh, the pressure, this is partially saturated in this zone here. This is called the Vado zone. And so we'll talk about saturation in a little bit, but saturation of water is less than 100%. By definition. Um, and again, from what we said before, since we know from Darcy's law that the velocity is equal to hydraulic conductivity times a gradient, 
this is the gradient, roughly. That's not absolutely true, but good enough for our purposes now. The negative sign, oops, that's an equal sign. The negative sign that we attach to this means that the velocity of flow is in the opposite direction from the gradient. Right? So you know that if you have an xy plot, this is a positive gradient. So in other words, it goes in positive direction each of the coordinates. This is x coordinate, h coordinate. So a positive gradient would be this. A negative gradient would be this. So this in this particular case is a negative gradient. This is a positive number. A negative times a negative gives you a positive velocity. And the velocity is positive in the direction of the x, positive x direction, so just sign convention. But the bottom line is that the velocity in this would be from uh, left to right, your left to, to your right. And so water coming through this, through this smear, would pick up stuff here, and it would carry the plume downstream, which would start to develop like this in time. And so this stuff would be laden with dissolved gasoline, uh, not gasoline, uh, organic materials, not because gasoline would sit on the surface. And this stuff would be relative pristine because it's coming in from the upstream. So that's the, the kinds of systems that we'd like to be able to, to understand. And so to do that, and it's basically shown in the cameo exactly what we're interested in figuring out here. These are what the two systems look like. They look slightly different to each other. One has gone down to a capillary barrier. One has stopped at the water table. We have a lens present in each case uh, that will dissolve in the water as it flows through it. And we're interested in this case, what does this look like? because this ends up being the source for contamination, which will be carried downstream. So that's our first question that we're uh, attaching ourselves. And the questions are, are just arranged there. So that's kind of where we want to, to get to. Um, I mentioned some uh, course resources. Uh, the one that we'll use for this is Jacob Baer's book, uh, I think 1990, yeah, it is 1998. So I don't think you need to get it, but um, it's a, a backup reference if you, you want to. Uh, to be able to, to to understand more, I guess, about if things aren't clear from what we're talking about. So, two kinds of displacement. Miscible displacement is where we get stuff mixing. So, in other words, you take a beaker, you put ink in that beaker, the beaker spread, the ink spreads out in the beaker, it's miscible in that water. If you take uh, these organic fluids or gasoline, which don't mix, then they'll stay separate. And so they behave differently. And so we need to be clear that we're talking about, in this first case, about immiscible displacement, how it travels as a free phase to get to some location where it's held by uh, gravity forces trying to move it and interfacial tensions trying to keep it in place versus it dissolving in the groundwater and then being carried away as a dissolved plume, which is miscible displacement. So we're not going to talk about this at all yet. And so we need to understand a little bit about some, some definitions. First definition is saturation. So if you take a porous medium and say this porous medium was um, a bunch of grains that make up the, uh, the solid, and around those grains we have some void space, if you could somehow magically centrifuge this so that all the grains would end up in one part, this was equal to uh, the total volume, which we could call also call equal to 1. I always do my volumes with a line through them. So Vt with a line, V with a line through it, sub T is this height. So if you like, then the volume of solids would be this amount. The volume of voids would be this amount by proportion. And the saturation would be the proportion of this, which was water filled. So in other words, this height here would be V water. And by definition, the saturation is equal to the volume of water over the volume of voids. So in other words, if it's, uh, the void space is 100% water filled, then the saturation is 
if the void space is 50% water filled, it's 0.5 or 50%. So that's our, our definition. We can talk about saturation in terms of the saturation of water, typically SW, but we could also talk about the saturation of anything else that's in it. And so if, for instance, um, the volume of voids was equal to uh, 1, whatever meters cubed, and the volume of water was equal to 0 0.3 meters cubed, then the saturation of water would be equal to 0.3, by definition. And the saturation of air, terrible, if it was air-filled, would be equal to the remainder, 0 0.7. And so this could be the saturation of air, or there could be another fluid in there as well. So there could be gasoline, air, and water in the void space. And so if we want to capture that in a general way, then we just talk about the volume of fluid, whatever the fluid is, within the void space, divided by the volume of the void space within whatever characteristic volume of our aquifer we have. So it's, it's relatively straightforward. So that's a, a basic definition which we'll use. So it ranges between... Saturations range between, have to be greater than zero, have to be less than 100%. Uh, sometimes we use decimal. Um, there are other definitions of volume contents of moisture. Uh, soil physicists, for instance, use volumetric moisture content, which is the volume of water divided by the total volume. So the total volume is that the water, in, the, the aquifer including the solids, so it's different. So in other words, by definition, if it's 100% saturated, <coughs> then the, um, the volumetric moisture content at that saturation would be equal to the porosity, right? Since by definition, the porosity, which we haven't defined, is equal to the volume of voids of the volume total. So in other words, if it's 100% saturated with water and we filled up all of the void space, then by definition, the volumetric moisture content would be equal to the porosity. And just to make things more complicated, this is the main definition we'll use. This is maybe a subsidiary definition we'll use. And the third one is one which is used in soil mechanics, which is by weight. And so the weight of water divided by the weight of solid. So just different, different definitions. But by far, we'll... By far, we'll use the uh, saturation. And so if we go back to our system here, then we would think that if we're looking at this, then this is below the water table. And so the saturation of water here, we think, would be equal to 100%. The saturation of the non-wetting phase here uh, might be equal to also about 100% in this lens. Uh, and so we, we start to have a way of being able to classify exactly what these distributions are. In, in fact, in this chimney where we said that we thought we might have a smear of this, then what would we expect to have? Well, we might expect to have the saturation of water might be equal to 70%. And I know I'm skipping between decimals and uh, percentages. And the saturation of the non-wetting fluid or the napple might be of the order of 30%. It, they'd have to sum up to 100. And so that's one way for us to be able to think about each of these. All right. So our reason then for also looking at that, I guess, is if we can look at this. What do I want to look at? I want to look at this. So that actually this is... So this is exactly what we're, we're interested in thinking about. So we've talked about this behavior in terms of lenses. So we've talked about what these uh, geometries might look like for these two different behaviors. So D napples will penetrate through to a capillary barrier. Uh, L napples will not. We can think about this material here as being 100% of this spilled material and being air-filled voids out here and water-filled voids below it. But the reality is that that's not quite true. If you look at in, uh, microscopically at the, the sand grains and exactly what they look like, 
These are not bubbles. These are individual grains of sand. I guess we talked last time about switching the lights off. Should we do that? And so what you can see is that these would be grains of sand which are butt onto a piece of glass. And you can see that around here, this is this meniscus of this little tongue, if you like, of this spilled Dean apple or an Elm apple that's pushed away water that's around it and actually then got trapped because presumably the, the forces that are attached to this uh, front are holding it exactly in place. And so that's the kind of mechanism that we'd like to be able to understand because that will say something about whether we'd expect that this invasing, invading fluid would completely fill the pore space here or it would just um, be present as this kind of long finger or tongue where there's water in some of the pore space here uh, which is isolated relative to this. So we'd like to be able to understand the mechanisms by, by which that occurs. Maybe you can see it better in, in this one. This is another figure that does the same thing. So this is, if you can see this, I guess it can't go. So this is a, again a bead pack. It's had this been filled with water. It's had this other stuff uh, pushed in, just this non-aqueous phase liquid. These are the grains you can see here which are larger above than below. And you can see that this stuff traveling down has basically completely saturated this in this red fluid. But when it gets to this quote-unquote capillary barrier, because the grains are smaller, you'd expect the pore throats to be smaller. And it's got trapped by this interface here. And it's only kind of pushing itself away down presumably where the openings are larger than the average here and it's chosen these little fingers to be able to try and penetrate. And so that's kind of the one of the big issues in looking at the initial distribution of these fluids is that they're really tough to be able to figure out exactly where they are. Not in this part where it's sitting as a nice lens that's on top of this capillary barrier, but once it gets through that and it has these fingers, if you drill a hole down here you might presume or conclude that it's perfectly clean and if you drill one down here, perfectly clean as well, but you know it's not. And that's and because these have relatively high volume, high surface area to volume ratios, any fluid which flows past this will actually have a large surface area to be able to dissolve the material from. And so that's kind of the understanding that we'd like to be able to figure out. Um, there's some figures in your notes that look at some experiments, again, doing the same thing, dropping a non-aqueous fluid from the surface to, um, to the Vado zone and looking how it spreads out. Those are the kinds of things we like to, to be able to understand. And so what we'll talk about today is the, the background we need to, to, be, to be able to do that. Okay? The fundamental uh, process, I guess, or the fundamental parameter that governs this behavior are two. One is the, the density of the fluid, which controls the force that it applies, in whether it travels downwards or stops at a buoyant interface. And the other one is the effect of interfacial tension, surface tension. And so uh, I don't think this is a particularly important formula, but uh, it kind of says if uh, it defines the amount of work that you have to apply to be able to pull two liquids that are present against each other, liquid K and liquid I, which of interface with each other. If you want to physically pull them apart so that between them is the vapor, combined vapor of these two liquids, the amount of work you have to apply to do that is equal to the surface tension of each of these fluids minus the interfacial tension between them. And so the surface tension is the, the force that's applied between a surface and that fluid if it has its vapor sitting on top of it. And we can measure that by, say, the height rise in the capillary tube with vapor. And the interfacial tension is where it has a mixed vapor between them, uh, and we can measure both of those things. And so we'll primarily work with interfacial tensions, where we have maybe a, uh, a liquid with some gas above it. Um, I'm not sure that we care too much about this expression other than the fact that it exists. The work, of course, is equal to, so surface tension has units of newtons per meter, so force per meter. This is work, 
So if you think about multiplying this by a meter and a meter, then that's equal to Newton meters per meter squared. And so this is, of course, work. And so this would be this. So it's actually work per unit area that you're pulling these apart. So that's more of a curiosity than more, more, more than anything. But the important things are to be able to understand how that would relate to what we've talked about, putting stuff, gasoline on the top of the swimming pool or putting treacle on the top of the swimming pool, when you decide whether it would spread out or not. It's really a pretty straightforward idea and that if you put a non-aqueous liquid that is lighter than uh, liquid A on the top of liquid A, then it would exist as, as a lens, and that lens would have a certain interface angles between liquid B and the gas above it, which is this trajectory here, by liquid B and the liquid A below it, which is this trajectory here, and also at the interface between the liquid and the gas. So this could be air, this could be gasoline, this could be water. And so this three-point um, three, three location, uh, triple point, I guess, you would think of it as a triple point, is really a force diagram. So if you knew what the interfacial tensions are that are acting at this particular location as physical properties, then we can do a force balance. And if the force acting in this direction is larger than the sum of the two components acting in this direction, which is really what this is saying here. This is just a force balance. This cosine here is just the component of this force acting in this direction, not particularly important. But if this force here is larger than these properties, these two pr physical properties, then it will form a monolayer and spread across. So in other words, if this criterion is satisfied, and from knowing what these material properties are for liquid A and liquid B, and liquid B and the gas, if we know what these properties are, and we know what this property is, we could figure out whether it would sit as a lens on the surface or whether it would spread out. The reality is, for all the materials that we're talking about, they will spread out into this mono layer, which is, we've drawn before, which is this. Right? They'll, they'll look like this. But if we have the added effect of it has this porous medium around it, the porous medium where it attaches itself partly to those grains is pulling it back. So there's an extra force keeping it in place. So that essentially is the reason why this would look like a lens when you put it in a porous medium, but not look like a lens, well, it'd be a, a monolayer lens if you put it on a swing. So that's basically the, the physics of what's going on, if you like, as to why it would look like that. Um, if you do the same calculation, which we can do, instead of being um, a liquid that we put this on top of, so this was originally liquid A, which was water, which we dumped this stuff on, and it made a lens and then spread out, you could instead put this on a windshield. And you know that when you look at a windshield, you'll have a little drop on here, if you haven't looked closely at what it would look like, it's a little drop that would be happy to travel down gradient. This angle here would be higher than this angle here because this has already been wetted by the fluid which is traveling. Sorry, it has not yet been wetted the surface it's traveling over. This is being retracted on a surface that's already water wet, and that's why it's asymmetric. But this could be a windshield, or it could also be a grain of sand which we're going to stretch out this surface so that it looks like, I guess if you looked at a little piece of this grain of sand, it would look like this, right? And on that grain of sand, we might have some stuff that sits here. And so this is relevant for us talking about porous medium because this is quartz. This is what the lens will look like when you put it on the quartz. And we can do exactly the same calculations we did before by looking at the force balance at this little point here the force between the gas and the liquid, the force between the liquid and the solid, and the force between the gas and the solid. We can do the same accounting as before, and that is if this force here, due to the material properties, 
is larger than the sum of these two forces pulling it back by each of these components here, which is really what this is saying here. Actually, it's what this is saying here. Then we'd know that it would travel across here and completely wet the system. And it will tend, because this is uh, static and there's some kind of adhesion here, it'll tend to have some kind of contact angle. And maybe the only thing to remember from what we've talked about here is it's important to know exactly what this contact angle is. So for instance, if this is our quartz substrate, this is our liquid, and this is, say, a gas, then this angle here that these two make, this angle which we call theta, which by definition this angle theta is always written uh, from in the liquid, in the denser liquid, um, then this, if this angle is less than 90 degrees, it says that the liquid so-called wets the solid. So in other words, this solid is wetted by this liquid, and it will create a, an interface that looks like this. If in the converse, it looks like this. This is our bead of liquid. This is our gas outside this, and this is the solid here. Then this here is the interface angle. We measure the interface angle within the, the liquid, and so now theta is greater than 90 degrees. And so in this case, we would say that the is this one here. The liquid non-wets. Terrible writing. Solid. I have to work on that. So. And that's important because it's important as to, it says what the resistance, yeah. what the force is pulling this back into place would be. Uh, and typically most of the systems we'll work with will be systems where uh, they are water wet. So in other words, the meniscus in the pore space will look like this and not like this. Here I guess you'd call this as hydro... Um, philic. It likes the surface. So in other words, it loves the solid surface and it wants to cover it. Here it's hydrophobic, and it doesn't want to see the. the it's hydrophobic to the surface. It don't want, doesn't want to have any contact with the surface at all. So that's physically the the, the the difference. And of course, that's how detergents work. They change something, for, which is water, which doesn't like to wet the surfaces of things. It reduces the surface tension. It makes this angle much smaller, so it actually flows all the way over it. And so that's an important concern when we start talking about these behaviors. Um, you'll see these behaviors if you have a capri tube. How are we doing for time? So if you take uh, a capri tube, a thin piece of glass, or a thin tube of glass, and put it into water, then you'll get water that rises up in this to some height, which later today we'll call H sub C. But it won't have a flat interface with the glass on the inside. It depends on what the characteristics are of whether the water wets the, the glass or not. Usually if the water wets the glass, it would look like this. And so the meniscus inside the tube, if I draw it properly, would look like concave upwards. And this is typical for uh, water in, uh, on glass. Glass is the same as quartz, which is what sandstones and sands are made of. If you have a system for instance, uh, you probably know this, something like mercury. Mercury is a non-wetting fluid. So if you put mercury, which I guess is what, Hg, in a glass tube, instead of being concave upwards, it'll be concave downwards. It's Instead of wetting the glass, it non-wets the glass. And so they just behave differently. And so you can get the same behavior with water and air, depending on what this substrate is. This would be glass. This would be something other than glass. This could be, for instance, limestone. Turns out that limestone is a non-wetting 
non, not water wet, which is useful to know. Not that you need to know it now. Okay, so <laughs> it may seem kind of esoteric what we're talking about, but uh, in terms of interfacial tension, but it controls the battle, if you like, between two forces. One is the weight of something, which is driving the flow into the subsurface. It's being resisted by interfacial tension, which is pushing it back. Uh, and the reason that it stops at some location is because those forces are exactly balanced, and therefore uh, one can't overcome the other. Right? Okay. All right. So, um, the previous discussion on that page is just explaining what I'm going to talk about here, so I won't really, so I'm not rushing through it. So, we're interested in understanding something about how porous media behave. We looked at these figures, uh, and they said something about how, at the micro scale, if you look at individual pores, then there'll be some difference in the relative contents of water and the red fluid if you're here, relative to here, relative to here. Right? They're in different proportions. This would be 100% water saturated. This might be 30% water, might be. 70% water saturated, this might be 10% water saturated. And so when we look at real materials, um, we can define behaviors simply in terms of this. This comes from uh, Bear's book. Uh, these individual portions here, these are the grains. So the striped portions are the individual grains of quartz. Uh, the reference in that book is towards a petroleum reservoir. So it starts with a sandstone, which is water wet. So in other words, it loves water. It hates oil. Um, the black is the oil in each case. And the white is uh, the water. So this is a petroleum reservoir. It's formed kilometers underground. Uh, crude oil has accumulated over millions of years as it's formed and buoyed up in the system. And so if you look at this, a large proportion of the pore space, which is the space between the grains, is now filled with this oil. But if, if you can see this, you can see right in here, I don't want to write on top of it, but right here, there's a little bit of white, water. Right here, there's a little bit of white. Right here, there's a little bit of white. And so if you kind of drew this out, and actually you might have a better picture of this, then you could imagine that if you had two grains that were touching each other, and if you put some water in contact with those, what the water would do is, because it loves these grains so much, it would make a little bit, it would make a connection to them. So you could imagine taking two grains, putting some water between them, you could perhaps hold the, the upper grain, the lower grain up with the upper grain just by the interfacial tension of that water. And so what it's doing is it's causing like a donut around it. It's a torus, like a, yeah, like a donut, where the hole is where the actual physical grains impact on each other. And from what we know about um, wetting fluids, we'd expect that the whole of the, the surface of this grain to have a mono layer of water around it. I wish I had a different color, but I don't. So the whole of the grain will have a mono layer of water around it, and also in this contact portion here. And so that defines, I guess, that defines these little points here, which are these white areas. And the regions which are not water-filled, in this case, would be filled with oil, right? Oil would fill up the remaining pocket, which is around this, which is this dark region. And so you start off with a reservoir, which has what is called pendular saturation of water. It's just a term. It means a pendant of water is held here, and it's isolated because you have this much larger glob of oil here. If you then suck the oil out of this reservoir, because if you go from this point here to this point here, you pass completely through here through oil, and so if you suck something out of here, it's fully continuous oil, and so it can pull its buddies along, and it will remove the oil. As you reduce the oil content, then it has to be replaced by something, it'll be replaced by water. And so as you suck the oil out, you go down from this 
top figure to this next one, where now there's more water. And progressively, as you keep on sucking the oil out and replacing it with water, which might be a remediation, for instance, in a groundwater problem, you're left off with these little bubbles of oil surrounded by water all around them. And so the relevance of that is now, if you're sucking fluid out of here, all you're going to be sucking is water. This oil is no longer connected to this glob here. It's not continuous phase. It will have a hard time pulling this bubble, not really a bubble, it's not buoyant particularly, but this glob of oil through here. And so now, suck as you might, all your suck out is, is water out of the system. And so you move from what was originally called this pendular saturation, just in terms of terms. So these pendants of water surrounding these grains, as we talked about here, grain on grain, it has a pendant of water that surrounds it, to what is referred to as, I guess, funicular saturation. And I don't know what the root of funicular is. It's either Greek or Latin. But a funicular railroad is one of those cog railroads that you go up a mountain on. And so what funicular refers to here is that if you want to physically pull this glob of oil out of the system, you have to put it on the cog railway and pull it out. The cog railway in this particular case is the water which you're traveling, pulling through there. And you hope that with the drag on that glob, you'll pull the, the, water, the, the oil out as well. You won't in reality, but that's the reason for the discussion or the terminology of funicular saturation. If um, the sand, instead of being water wet, is oil wet, then the stuff that clings onto the grains will be the oil, and it will be a mono layer around the grains, and exactly the reverse would be uh, the case. And so it's a bit complicated, right, because we have these changes in saturation that we have to know something about. But I suppose the main takeaway point from this is that if you want to be able to suck oil as a petroleum engineer or oily contaminants as an environmental engineer out of the system, you need a continuous phase existing between inside this pore and the place where you're sucking it from. And as soon as you don't have a continuous phase, then you don't suck it out anymore. And all you'll suck out is a dissolved product. And so if you want to, to go back, that's really what is discussed here. And I, I, I've said it, so I won't go back through it. Okay? All right. So the other thing that we could do is if we want to understand something about these systems, we realize uh, in this case that, for instance, the saturation of water here might be, I don't know, 10%. The saturation of the non-wetting fluid might be 90%. The converse is true here, I would think. The saturation of the non-wetting might be 10%. And the saturation of the wetting might be 90 So we've completely switched the roles of these. So what we could do is we could try and think of this porous medium as a really simple system. And the simplest system might be that if we think of it really just as the pore space that we have here. This pore space is kind of connected to this. So you could think of it as a pore volume that's connected to another pore volume through a little connector. And you could think of this connector as just being a ca capillary tube. So now there's this connector which the stuff has to go through to be able to move from one to another. It could be just a glass tube, and it might have some internal diameter, which I think we'll call lowercase d. And that certainly represents this individual, maybe this linkage between these two points here. Maybe there's a linkage between these points here and these points here. So you could actually think of it as a whole bundle of these capillaries. So not just one, but a whole bunch of them. But let's take one as a representative. So this one capillary represents the connection between one pore space and another pore space. And the easiest way for us to think about it is exactly as a capillary tube. So instead of pushing fluid along it, we take the capillary tube and we hold it upside down vertically, and we just put it into water. If we put it into water, we allow 
the fluid to rise up to some equilibrium, equilibrium location. And we know that if this is the water surface here, then the pressure here is atmospheric. We know as we go horizontally across from here that the pressure here has to be atmospheric as well. So in other words, we could take this capillary, we could just cut, cut it off at the bottom and hold it up upright. So we could take the capillary tube, which is now pulled out of the water at this point here. It has water risen up into it at some height, H sub C. We know the, the pressure here has to be atmospheric because we're holding it up. We've completely detached it. And if we do a free body diagram, what we have to do is we calculate the force that we have to apply around this circular boundary here. If I drew it in perspective, right, this would be kind of a ring of revolution that we're pulling up on right here to be able to pull this up. And so if we do that calculation, what do we need to do? Um, we need to take the volume of this plug here is going to be equal to pi d squared upon 4 times hc. So this is this volume here. The unit weight of this is equal, this unit weight is going to be equal to the density of the fluid times gravity. This is unit weight. And so this is the force that's pulling downwards. And we merely equate that with the force that's pulling up. The force that's pulling up is going to be the interfacial tension, which is this force here, sigma 1, 2, multiplied by the circumference over which it's applied. So this is circumference. circumference here. Yeah. I will work on my writings, which is just uh, pi d. This is circumference, so this is circ, and this is a force, and so it's just a force bounce. This is due to the fact that there might be an interfacial angle between these, so this angle here is theta. Perhaps I'll draw it here. So this is this portion here, and this angle here then is theta. And so it's just the component that's acting vertically upwards. So this is, we can take it equal to 1. And if we rearrange that, we end up with the rise height in this capillary tube, which is proportional to the interfacial tension. Bigger interfacial, double the interfacial tension will go twice as high. And inversely proportional to the diameter. Half the diameter, it'll go twice as high as well. And so we kind of know that about capillary tubes. And so our interest in doing that is that this really says something about the magnitude of this force which is applied relative to the gravitational force that it's acting against. The same two features that are acting in our res reservoir aquifer. Gravity allows this bubble to go downwards because it's got gravity that's pushing it. Interfacial forces resist that by pushing it upwards. And so really you see the effects of these two things here is that this is interfacial tension stopping it moving uh, this is gravitational effect and its meniscus effect. No, sorry, what am I talking about? This is what's driving the, the flow by its unit weight. This is what's stopping the flow by resistance, by, by interfacial tension. So this is the height rise that we get. We know that, for instance, uh, a pressure is equal to a head multiplied by a unit weight of a fluid. This is a length. This is in newtons per meter cubed. This is in newtons per meter squared. So we certainly should recognize that. So if you multiply this head by a unit weight on each side, then we end up with something that's slightly different. And that is that we end up with a capillary pressure, a pressure which is proportional to 4 times unit weight divided by diameter. 
And pressure is useful because typically we define things in terms of pressures rather than heads because a head is ambiguous because a head of a different fluid will have a different pressure attached to it. But if you physically go into the, the, the fluid and measure a pressure, the pressure is the pressure. It doesn't relate in any way to what the fluid is. You can physically measure it. And so our interest in doing this is this allows us to be able to characterize uh, either the height rise um, that would occur a, in a, a capri tube. The higher the height rise, the higher the pressure difference would be between uh, the pressure that's measured here and the pressure that's measured here. So the other thing, I guess, yes, yeah, be, be worthwhile saying. So if we've taken this capillary tube and we've cut it off at the bottom here, and we've had this meniscus that's here, we know that the pressure acting at this point is equal to atmospheric because we've cut it off and we're holding it and so it has nothing but atmosphere uh, pushing down on it. The pressure that is acting at this point here also has to be atmospheric pressure. But what's the pressure that's acting immediately below this in the fluid? The pressure that's acting here is not necessarily atmospheric because, if you like, this has a tension applied to it. So in the surface of this fluid, there's some tension that's being applied. So the pressure here in the fluid is not equal to the atmospheric pressure. In fact, it will almost always be less than the atmospheric pressure. It's in tension. And so this difference between the fluid pressure in the gas and the fluid pressure in the water is defined as the capillary pressure by definition. This is what this is. And so in this particular case, this would be the pressure in the air or the atmospheric pressure. This would be the pressure as we've labeled it in the water. And by definition, this is usually taken as the difference between the pressures in the wetting fluid, which in this case is water, if this is glass in the capillary tube, and the non-wetting fluid which in this case is air, or an apple in this particular case, for the same arguments that we put together here. Right? So this would be the wetting fluid would be in here. The liquid wets this surface. The gas doesn't wet this surface in typical fluids. And that's all it's... Uh, so if we looked at this in terms of um, our uh, particular meniscus, it would be... This angle here, theta, is less than 90 degrees. And therefore, it's the liquid, the water in this particular case, wets that uh, surface. And so that's the, the, the definition of what's given. So we, we need a couple of definitions. The first is that we have uh, a capillary pressure, which by definition is always the difference between the non-wetting pressure minus the wetting pressure. So in this particular case, the water pressure is atmospheric. The pressure in the liquid is in tension, so it's less than atmospheric. And so in this particular case, this would be um, smaller than this, and therefore the capillary pressure, I guess, would be positive, right? The capillary pressure would be positive. This would be atmospheric. This would be less than atmospheric, so a minus, minus a larger positive should be a positive. So the capillary pressure will be positive in this particular case. Okay. So the only two important things to bring out of this are that if we look at two pores connected by a capillary, we can think of it just as a capillary tube. If we think of it as a capillary tube, then the resistance to flow along that tube is proportional to the interfacial tension and inversely proportional to the diameter. A big tube, it will displace very easily. A small tube, you'll have to provide a large pressure to move it. Uh, in the same size tubes, if you have a higher interfacial tension, you need a larger pressure to move something with a larger interfacial tension versus a small. Uh, and that's because of this scaling. 
And so a fundamental parameter that we'll use is this capillary pressure to be able to understand how we move fluids in, in beat packs as, as we do that. Okay. What else do we need to talk about? Well, that's probably enough. The other thing that we could do, and I don't think we'll belabor the point, is that instead of taking two pores in which we move fluids between through this capillary tube, another idealization, if you like, of a porous medium would be to take it as a whole bunch of marbles. And if you have a whole bunch of marbles, then the simplest p component of that bead pack, depending on how it was arranged, you know, the one repeating geometry, if it was a center-faced cubic pack system, would be just to take two marbles that look like this, where if you added water to them, then it would behave just as we kind of talked about before, is that you could think about having water that would hold these two things together. It would be present joining these two things. Conceivably, you could hold the top one and it would suspend the bottom one if it was strong enough, if the interfacial tension was strong enough. But the other thing that you could imagine if you think about this thing in 3D is that there are two curvatures on this. There's one curvature, which is this curvature here. So if I drew a radius and looked at this curvature here, that's one of the curvatures that's involved. The other curvature, of course, is this curvature that goes around the waist, if you like, of this um, water droplet. And so the second curvature is this curvature R, I think it's R2 here. And so what you might surmise if you think about this, what did we, we say about this? So this is a, a little capillary tube. This is a big honking cap capillary tube. What we'd expect with each of these would be that the capillary rise in this one would be quite high, right? Because we said H is proportional to um, interfacial tension interfacial tension and diameter. This of course is diameter. And so this would have a high height rise. This would have a low height rise. These are both H sub C's. So because this is trapped inside a very small capillary, you could imagine that the radius of curvature of this is pretty tight, and the radius of curvature is pretty open. And so it actually turns out that the capillary pressure is also proportional to this interfacial tension over D property. So you can imagine this is being really quite curved because it's got to fit inside this narrow capillary. And you can imagine that in the limit, as this was a really big capillary tube, it would basically the height rise would be zero, whoops, and it would be almost flat. So it'd be a very large radius of curvature. So the capillary pressure is actually proportional to inversely proportional to the to the radius of curvature. So this has a very small radius of curvature, the pressure is large. Small radius of curvature, big pressure. Big radius of curvature, small pressure. Okay. And so that is kind of manifest in what's referred to as Laplace's equation. This is the capillary pressure. It turns out that the capillary pressure, it's just another way of saying the things we've already done for a capillary tube, is equal to the interfacial tension of the fluid on the glass multiplied by the reciprocal of radius, I guess, one dash, and I guess this is radius two dashes. So there's two radio of curvature that are important. We're not going to derive it, but it's really saying something very similar to, uh, to what's going on here. And so all you need to remember is that if you have something that's very tightly, tight pore space, very small pore space, it's going to have a very small diameter or result in a, a, a very um, small radius of curvature, and it's going to take a very big pressure to push something through it.
and that's entirely consistent with our idea of a capillary barrier. It drops down to this thing, all of a sudden it goes into something where the pore space is so small that it needs a huge pressure to push it through there. The only pressure it has to push it through there is its self-weight, and so it can't do it. And so, as a result of that, it absolutely explains what we see here. Big pores, open diameters, little pores, small diameters. As it hits the interface between these two, all of a sudden it needs a big pressure, big overlying height of this fluid to push it through. If it's not big enough, it stops here, which it kind of generally does, except for the case that it finds some places, presumably, on this pathway where there's a nice slightly larger open pore space that's continuous, but it's able to escape along and to get to some point. And it may keep on going, and it will keep on going until it reaches some equilibrium. All right. Okay? So, yeah, that's it. So, we can think of it in terms of capri tubes, which is what we'll prefer to do, in which case this is an appropriate expression. I guess it would be actually, we should add actually each of the, uh, this is true for one. So in this case, if this was the radius of this, because um, this is a proportionality, I guess. And if it's this geometry, then this is radius one and radius double prime. So if it's, if it's this geometry, then this would suffice. If it's this geometry, then it's slightly different, but they just have two component radii of curvatures. And I guess the other thing that we should probably also remember is that our definition of capillary pressure is the difference between the pressure in the non-wetting fluid minus the pressure in the wetting fluid. In other words, if you look at this meniscus, there's a different pressure here than there is here. And that's a basic summary of where we are. So what's the relevance of that? Um, the relevance is that if you make, if you think of a microfluidics, this is all the rage in looking at printed circuits, looking at, you can make a, a nanoscale printed circuit and look at fluid transport along these. So if you could imagine a very idealized porous medium, which is a tube that, as you go along this tube, it starts out relatively narrow. So this is just a circular tube. Then it bells out, then it narrows again, bells out, narrows again, etc. And so if you were to look at the distribution of, say, um, I don't know, in this case it could be, uh, this could be diameter. I'm really going to have to practice my writing. So small diameter tubes, large diameter tubes, and this is the number of them. Then it's, if you did an assay along here, you'd have a certain number of small diameter tubes, and you'd have a certain number of large diameter tubes. They look like they're about the same per unit length in this particular case. If you looked at a porous medium, which looked like this, where you had a big tube and a small tube, the same two diameters as shown here, and maybe it kept on repeating, so there was a small tube, and then a big tube, and then a small tube, and then a big tube, as you went through here. If you drew up the histogram of this, it would look exactly the same, right? So in terms of the porosity, if you like, and the size of small pores and large pores, this and this, in average, if you didn't account for the structure, would look exactly the same. But then what would be the characteristics of these two geometries to moving these fluids through them. And so the one way to look at it would be just to flip it on edge. So you're going to pour some stuff in through here. This little channel here is going to catch it. Well, say it gets through here. This little channel here is going to catch it and it's going to need a very big pressure to put it through. If it doesn't have a very big height of this fluid above it to be able to provide the pressure that's pushing it down, then it's just going to stop. 
it's not going to move slowly through this. It's going to stop. And it's going to be held there. It's, it's a binary thing. It's not going to move at all. If you put the same stuff in this system, in both of these capillaries, as it goes into this one, because it doesn't have much weight above it, it's going to get held up here. But once you go into this big one, it's just going to be happy. The resistance to it moving down here is going to be tiny, and it's going to be happy just working its way through this. And so this, it matters what the geometry of our porous medium is as to whether it looks like this, which is going to be really tough to invade, which might be good because it keeps the stuff high up where you can suck it back out easily. Or in the case where you have some very small pores, but also some really continuous big pores, this is going to be the absolutely worst condition that you could have because it's going to go into this and it's going to scoot off to wherever it wants to go. And if you like, that's really what we've seen in this figure here. This is just a pore throat that is a bit larger on average as you go down through this. Um, the epitome of this, of course, would be something like a root hole, which would be really a big hole in the soil, or it fractures in rock. So as you drive up the 322 bypass um, and you look at the limestone cuts you go through and you look at them, you'll see structure of bedding in those and you'll also see fractures which are due to fracture planes. And so you could imagine that if you had something cutting through here which is a big honking fracture which had a big wide opening to it, then it's basically this behavior here. And this is going to be exactly the case that would give you, if we go back to this, the kind of behavior we really don't want. I guess we have some examples of it here. Actually, it's, it was in here, right? This, this behavior here. No, it's this behavior here. So in other words, it's going to go, it's going to take a, a trip through this, it's going to find the biggest pore spaces, and it's going to make this contiguous pattern which goes all the way through this. If you then spill any more material here, It'll be happy to follow it and add some extra weight to it and try keeping on traveling downwards until it gets to somewhere where it's stopped for some reason. I guess I can't draw on this. And the reason that it stops here is because this is a place where the barrier is quite a uh, capillary barrier where the, the pores are small. So that's kind of the, the gist of what we wanted to talk about today. The last thing to talk about is this very final page, which I won't do the... Uh, the derivation, but just talk in overview about what, what it means. So, if you did have a material which had a water table, oh, that's good, I can actually draw now, and this happened to have a whole bunch of fractures in it, where these were open pathways, then you could also treat one of these fractures as being just a parallel sided conduit. So instead of being a capillary tube, which we looked at before, this would be just a parallel-sided open conduit, which is exactly what this is. And if you put these two thinly separated plates into water, as we're doing here, then you'd also expect to get a capillary rise in between them to some height. And if you do exactly the same um, force balance that you cut this off at the base, you look at the forces that you have to apply to keep this held up here, which is really all we're doing. We're balancing these vertical forces here that get applied on two sides of this plate. So this is the interfacial tension here. This is the weight of this, which is equal to this height here, H sub C times the width B times the length into the page, which is W. So this is volume. This is unit weight. So this is overall weight. This is the interfacial tension pulling up. It's on two sides, and it's over some length. And it might be at some angle. And this is the force acting upwards. This is acting downwards. You do the balance, and you get two relationships. One is the height rise is, again, proportional to the interfacial tension and inversely proportional to how 
bigger the capillary is, the smaller it is, the higher the rise will be. And the capillary pressures we could surmise written in the same uh, notation as below, before, the non-wetting versus minus the wetting pressure. The pressure difference between the air on this surface and the pressure in the water just below that surface is going to be given by this magnitude here. And so what we'll do next time is we'll realize that now, well, we have kind of understand a little bit about why <laughs> fluids don't travel very easily down these very thin capillaries. And so that might be good in some circumstances because we have to apply large pressure. So if you're worried about where it might go to in the subsurface, it's good if it's small because it can't get away. But if you're trying to suck it out, the opposite is true. You like it to be big so you can suck it out. So we know if, what the functional relationships should be for these very simple systems. But we know that porous media don't particularly look like these very idealized systems that we've talked about so far. So what next time we'd like to look at is how do we characterize behaviors not in terms of these very simple uh, geometries that we've talked about capillary tubes, but how do we take an aquifer that might fill this box and describe in some way the relationships between the pressure that we have to put into it to drive it relative to the resistance to it flowing. And that's, that's what we'll do next time. I don't stop to ask any questions, but we're out of time, but I'm happy to take questions now or as, as you step out. Okay?